So one of the interesting things that seems to be coming up quite often in this whole coronavirus crisis is the similarities and differences between coronavirus or COVID-19 and the bog standard seasonal flu influenza that we get every year. Some people are saying that this novel coronavirus is a lot more deadly, but we've got other people, including me in a previous video, sort of implying that actually the standard seasonal flu kills loads of people every year and no one bats an eyelid over that. So in this video, I wanna discuss the issue with hopefully a little bit more nuance than I did in a previous video. So we're gonna be talking about the similarities and differences between coronavirus and the seasonal flu in terms of symptoms, in terms of treatment, and most excitingly, in terms of the mortality statistics and how bad each of these things are for you from the information we've got so far. Okay, so point number one is about the symptoms. How do you know whether you have coronavirus, COVID-19, or whether you just have the seasonal flu? And honestly, the truth is, just based on symptoms alone, it's really quite hard to know. So this table is drawn up from information from the World Health Organization and from the National Health Service, the NHS of the UK. And you'll see that the symptoms of COVID-19 versus the seasonal flu are pretty common. The main things in COVID-19 seem to be a fever and dry cough, but to be honest, you also get those with the flu. And yeah, because they're both respiratory viruses, essentially there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms. Interestingly, the WHO is estimating that the incubation period of COVID-19 is about 14 days, i.e. that's the amount of time that it can stay in your system before it starts to give you symptoms. Whereas with the standard seasonal flu, the incubation time is a lot shorter. So people estimate about three days-ish between catching the virus and developing symptoms. But again, it's really hard to tell the difference between the two just on the basis of that. Like, how will you know when you caught the virus and how will you be able to say for certain when you started developing symptoms of the thing? And we can't really use that as a differentiator between whether we've got COVID-19 or whether we've got the standard flu. And as usual, different countries have different ways of resolving the conundrum. So in the UK, for example, we've got the NHS one-on-one -on -one helpline that you can call up. And if you think you might have the flu or you might have COVID-19, they'll be able to guide you appropriately. And one of the things they check is, you know, have you traveled to this list of countries? Have you had contact with anyone who's confirmed to have COVID-19, which massively increases your own risk of getting it? Whereas if you've just got the symptoms, but you don't have any of the epidemiological factors, then it's more likely to be the flu rather than COVID-19. But the main message here is that you really can't tell just based on symptoms alone. So please do whichever country you're in, contact your local healthcare provider. Do not go into hospital thinking you have COVID-19 because then you're just going to be infecting other people. I'm sure every country will have their own systems for doing the test in an isolated space. So for example, in the UK, we've got these kind of coronavirus pods outside most hospitals. We've got these drive-through services where you can just drive in your car, someone will swab your mouth and then they'll do the test without you running the risk of infecting other people. Okay, so we've said that the symptoms of the two are basically the same, but what about the treatments and how does that differ? Firstly, in terms of medication, uh, antibiotics will not work because antibiotics are antibacterial agents and both COVID-19 coronavirus and the seasonal flu are caused by viruses. And antibiotics do not work against viruses, so there is literally no point in taking antibiotics if you think you have either of them. Antivirals are a bit more complicated. So in China, in the US, and in a few other countries, they're working on trials where they're trying out drugs that we know work against some viruses, like HIV, and trying to see whether they might work against coronavirus as well. In terms of the seasonal flu, we do have a drug called Oseltamivir or Tamiflu that is sometimes given to patients who have severe symptoms within the first 48 hours. But unfortunately, we don't really have an analog to Tamiflu in the coronavirus COVID-19 cases. Secondly, in terms of vaccines, there is a big difference between COVID-19 and the flu. The flu does have a vaccine, whereas coronavirus, COVID, I'm, I'm just gonna call it COVID-19. COVID-19 does not have a vaccine just yet. People are estimating that it'll be at least 12 to 18 months before we get a vaccine developed and in circulation for COVID-19. Whereas the vaccine kind of system for the seasonal flu is very well established. And every year, scientists around the world figure out what that, that year's kind of common dangerous strain of the seasonal flu is gonna be and make a vaccine against that. And at least in the UK, that gets given to a load of people. So for example, uh, people who work in healthcare settings, I get the flu vaccine every year. People who are old, people who have, have other medical problems. There's all sorts of criteria for who can get the vaccine. And in fact, in the UK, if you want, you can just go get the vaccine, even if you don't fit into the criteria. So, so far it's sounding like there's not a lot we can do about coronavirus. We don't have any medication that works against it. We're trying out some antivirals and the hope fingers crossed that they might work and we don't have a vaccine for it. And in fact, with COVID-19, the only thing we can really do is offer supportive treatment for the people who need it. So supportive treatment basically means helping your body to breathe while your body naturally fights against the disease. So this is what they do in intensive care, sometimes with things like mechanical ventilation, sometimes with assisted ventilation, it helps the patient breathe, essentially like maintaining their respiratory function while, while their immune system is fighting off the virus. This is pretty similar to the treatment for seasonal flu as well. So every year thousands of patients are hospitalized because of the seasonal flu. And again, the management is mostly supportive. They can end up on ven ventilatory support, basically helping their breathing 
breathing while their own body fights off the virus. The good news is that in the case of COVID-19 and also in the case of the flu, most people, the majority, 80%, around 80% for COVID-19, will have mild symptoms, which means they don't need help with their breathing. But the bad news is that even though only about 15 to 20% of the patients actually get severe complications as a result of COVID-19, the fact that it's going around and growing at an exponential rate means that depending on how many people it infects in the population, the number of beds in hospitals that can provide ventilatory support might be a limiting factor. So in Italy, for example, where there are currently 9,172 confirmed cases of COVID-19 as of the 10th of March when I'm recording this video, we've seen a few comments from Italian doctors specializing in intensive care via Twitter and Facebook and stuff that are saying that the country has run out of intensive care beds to the point where, you know, elective operations are having to be canceled and operating theaters are being converted into intensive care units because they just need so many more ITU beds in order to deal with the load of the virus. Now, this is actually very concerning. In the UK, for example, at the moment, we only have 373 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And again, the majority of those are gonna be mild, but there are more and more people starting to get admitted into intensive care in order to provide vent ventilatory support. So if the virus spreads around the UK to the extent that it has in Italy, or maybe worse, there is a risk that we might run out of intensive care beds and that would cause an enormous load on the healthcare system. And that would mean that there would be some patients who need respiratory support, but who physically can't get it because all of the beds are full. At the moment, thankfully, we're not quite there in the UK, but we know that Italy is basically as developed as the UK in terms of a healthcare system, possibly even more. And they are really, really struggling to deal with the implications of the coronavirus. And in fact, in Italy, apparently the hospitals are stretched to 200% of their normal capacity, which is completely unsustainable for any reasonable length of time. Okay, so we've looked at the symptoms and the possible treatments for COVID-19 and the seasonal flu. Let's now compare their mortality rates, like which of those is actually more dangerous so far. Firstly, seasonal flu, according to research from the University of Edinburgh, hits around 40 million people each year around the world, 40 million, of which around 400,000 people die every year. But that gives us a mortality figure of less than 1%. You might even have seen our glorious leader, President Donald Trump, talking about this idea in a recent news conference. He said that in America alone, the standard seasonal flu kills between 25,000 and 69,000 people per year, and estimates that over the last 10 years, 360,000 people have died of the seasonal flu in America. Now, in this case, President Trump's statistics are broadly accurate. And when you compare those tens of thousands of people in America alone who die each year from the flu, compared to the 23 people who have died so far from COVID-19, that seems like a very large number of the standard flu compared to a very small number of deaths caused by COVID-19. But unfortunately, there are some other statistics that paint a less optimistic picture of COVID-19. So you know how we said that the mortality rate for, inf for influenza, the seasonal flu, is about 1%. If we look at the figures for COVID-19 so far, of the 116,558 confirmed cases, we have 4,090 deaths which puts the mortality rate at around about three and a bit percent. So based on the data so far, COVID-19 is about three times more likely to kill you than the seasonal flu. In fairness, and something that will complicate this debate a little bit, is the fact that that figure is probably a little bit too high. So for example, Professor Chris Whitty, who is the Chief Medical Officer of England, he says that actually the, total, the overall mortality rate for COVID-19 is probably closer to 1%, if not less than 1%, which would put it at a similar footing to the seasonal flu. And the reason why that's not accounted for in the data so far is that because a disproportionate number of cases were in the Hubei province of China, which is where the outbreak first started, and that was not quite prepared to deal with the ramifications of the disease. And the fact that there are so many cases that are probably roaming around that haven't been tested officially for COVID-19. So remember, these 116,558 confirmed cases so far are just that. They are confirmed cases, the people who have had the test and who have tested positive for it. So in reality, the number of people who actually have the condition, but just have mild symptoms, like 80% of people infected with the virus do, might not even know that they have the disease at all and therefore wouldn't be accounted for in that overall confirmed cases estimate. The other thing to keep in mind that isn't really mentioned when people talk about this whole flu versus coronavirus thing is the fact that we know what the flu is. We know it's natural progression. We've developed vaccines for it. We've got treatments for it. We know what the score is with the flu. And yeah, it's unfortunate that every year 40 million people get infected by it and 400,000 people will die from it, but it is the enemy that we know about. Whereas the problem at the moment is that coronavirus, COVID-19, is the enemy that we don't know about. We don't really know a lot about it yet. We know roughly some details, we know vaguely what kind of symptoms it causes, and we do thankfully have a test that confirms or rejects whether, whether or not you have the condition. But we don't have any treatments, we don't have any vaccines, we don't know how quickly it's gonna spread. We don't even really know for certain how COVID-19 is spread. 
Our best theory, which I think is probably right, is that it's an airborne virus particle disease, but it's not 100% confirmed yet. So yeah, COVID-19 is a massive gray area, and the fact that it seems to be accelerating at an exponential rate, like every day we're seeing more and more cases, and the fact that a lot of the world isn't yet prepared for dealing with it, and in fact, a lot of the world isn't even really taking it seriously. All that means that we're dealing with an enemy here that we really don't know much about and that could be a lot worse than we've anticipated. So this comparison between coronavirus and the flu, yes, it works on some levels, but it usually fails to appreciate the fact that it's a lot easier to deal with something you know about, like the flu. <laughs> it's a lot harder to deal with something you don't know about that is spreading through society seemingly like wildfire and that is causing problems already for first world healthcare systems that are not able to cope with it. Finally, just quickly talking about the effects on society of coronavirus versus the flu. Yeah, every year 40 million people get the flu, 400,000 people die of it, but like really no one actually cares. Like we don't stop events, the global financial markets don't shut down, we don't close schools and businesses and stuff because of the flu. We certainly don't put entire countries into lockdown because of the flu. On the other hand, because of COVID-19, because of the uncertainty that's been surrounding it about like we don't really know how long the incubation period is, we don't really know how quickly it's gonna spread. All of these factors mean that we're taking as a society and it's a good thing that we are taking lots of precautions to try and delay its spread or even contain its spread. And so, for example, around the world, there's been a huge list of high profile events that would involve mass gatherings of people. You'll see them a list over there somewhere. All these events have had to be canceled because of the coronavirus. There's talk that the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo 2020 are gonna be canceled. There's talk that Euro 2020, the football tournament is also gonna to be canceled. And on top of this, we've also got the economic impact of the coronavirus, which we've never really before seen with, a, with an outbreak of the seasonal flu. So for example, the stock market has taken an absolute dive over the last few days to weeks to the point where people are comparing it to the 2008 financial crisis. And on a more micro scale, like if you get businesses and schools and communities shutting down, obviously that's gonna have an impact on society far more so with COVID-19 than the seasonal flu does. So that was an outline of the similarities and differences between the two. As usual, we wanna be hashtag alert, not anxious. Panicking is never the right solution, but with the information that's been coming out every day, this is seeming like more and more of a global threat. And so we really should take it seriously. And we certainly shouldn't be using the comparison with the seasonal flu as a reason for being complacent about the threat of the coronavirus. As usual, you'll find links in the video description to more helpful resources on the topic. Stay healthy, stay happy, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.